Hi guys and welcome to Journey to Journeyman episode number 34. On this exciting episode, it's all another, it's just basically another side project video where I was working on the shaper jaws and ran into so many side projects that I put it in a separate one. On this one, I'm trying to figure out the accuracy of the, the shaper bed and so I, I'm on a quest to figure out what's going on with that. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so this is what I have. This is the lowest one, so I call it the zero. This is plus two, plus two, and plus four. On my Shaper Jaws video, I had several side projects, and I decided to make separate videos with that. And this is the second of those. In this video, I'm going to try to figure out the accuracy of the Shaper. So in order to get to the bottom of why it's inaccurate, First thing I did was take off the vise, clean the table, and now I'm going to mount my work directly to the table, my little test piece, and see if I can figure out what's going on. So I've got an angle plate here. Got a piece of my just aluminum that I make from pop cans. And we got it kind of set up on there. And now I'm going to go about to see if I can, to see how accurate this is, kind of make it all flat and uh, check how accurate the machine is. So once I get it started cutting, I'm going to be playing with different tool geometries, different angles, different grinds on it, um, just trying to get this thing flat. I'll be also trying to check out what's the best tool to do the cutting. And I slowly just flatten the top of this. So there I was. Now, of course, the guys that know that I start telling a story with there I was, know that I usually start off with an F-16 pilot story, but today I'm going to change it up a little bit and give an airline story. My first landing in a commercial airliner. Now, I must say, the story is not actually about my first landing. It's about my second landing. Now, the very first time I flew a commercial airliner, it might be surprising for some of you to know that it, it was full of paying passengers. Now, back in the early days of flying, before they had these full motion simulators, they would take up groups of student pilots in an airliner without passengers, and that's how they would train. However, once the full motion simulator came on board, it was so sophisticated that the FAA signed off on the training being done in a simulator, and uh, that's your initial training. And then your final training is done in the airliner. And of course, these are with uh, highly trained instructors that are trained to be able to uh, step in and intervene. However, by the time you get to that level, there's very little intervention that needs to be done because uh, you're, you're pretty sharp by that time that you uh, get to that point. And even if it, they do intervene, 99% of the time, it's just verbally tell, telling you something that you need to correct. That's all. And once again, just to kind of keep things in perspective, these simulators are so incredibly sophisticated that if you were to blindfold me, put me in a simulator in the night mode and unblindfold me and let me fly into Chicago O'Hare, for example, I would be hard pressed to tell the difference that I wasn't in a real airliner. That's how, that's how close they are to the real thing. Now, in the daytime mode, you can see some of the stuff is kind of CGI, you know, computer-generated imagery. Okay, so that cleaned up pretty good. And now I'm going to try a finishing pass or two on there to try to make it a nice, pretty look. So I'm going to try this tool. I don't know if it'll work or not, but it's rounded and 
put that in there and see what it does. I'm not very good at it, but that's a, a grind that I saw that might make a, a beautiful finish pass. And so I, I'm just trying my hand at a, a new tool. Okay, that probably looks rougher than it really is in real life. I mean, this is smooth, <laughs> really smooth. Um, that was with a coarse feed across there. I wonder what it's like if I go with a fine feed across there, but uh, wow, unbelievable. So I decided to go back the other way with a one thousandths cut and the slowest step over and wow, absolutely, like, feels like glass. Now that's just beautiful. Now there are some harmonic lines in there, but it's absolutely beautifully smooth. Um, I'm sure the harmonic lines are from um, vibration that I'll have to work on getting out. But wow, did that turn out nice. So, time to do the other side. Now, this being the flatter side of the piece of aluminum, it takes a lot less to clean it up. Doing that same cleanup pass on the, on the back side with that same tool. Okay, something I just realized is these little bumps right here are chatter on the, uh, the clapper box as it's going back. The tool's rubbing there. Now, also, I couldn't figure out why there's a little ridge line in the back. So, I'll show you what I did, and I think I might know the problem. I just don't know how to fix it. So what I've been doing here for a couple of passes is lifting this up on the back stroke and then putting it down and holding it on the front stroke. That is really doing a tremendous thing. So I got to figure out, it's got to be something with the adjustment of this clapper box to make all this go away, the problems that I'm having. Not all of it, but some of the problems I'm having. And this is what I mean. This is what I do. Okay, well I'm getting better and I'm trying to figure out what's off here, whether it's the table or the RAM, and I can't figure it out. Um, I've tested them both and still just curious. So what I did was I mounted this to here, right to the table, and what I've ended up with is uh, on this side it's the same. But on this side, there's three and a half thousandths out and two and a half thousandths out. And that's when it's oriented like this. So, and that's straight mounted to the table. Now the table was showing a two thousandths different from this side to this side. So this would be zero. That's a one and a half thousandths. I think that's one thousandths and that's two. So I would think that this would mirror it, but can't get that. And what I think it is, is this is tapered on the side. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and get these uh, squared away, squared up, and then remount it to the table. And if things go like I think it should, there should only be a two thousandths difference in here. So let's give that a shot. So now back to my first airliner landing. Well, on the first one, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the instructor demonstrated the first landing. And now it's my turn. And I must say, it was a little nerve-wracking 
knowing that there are people on board here and I'm landing this thing for the first time. However, it went extremely well. A very nice touchdown at 2,000 feet, right in the touchdown zone, soft landing. So we got that uh, squared up. And now I need to get this side on both of these squared up. You see I'm running this thing right at the limit. This is over 7 inches, so it's a 7 inch shaper, so that's as far as it can go. All right, but maybe we need to get these other ones squared up and maybe we can figure out why it's off a little bit. Now, you didn't think that was the end of my airliner story with happily ever after rainbows and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, no. Now, the real story is my second airliner landing. Now, in the aviation industry, we talk a lot about sight picture and what it looks like when you're when you're landing an airplane or taking it off. So. My sight picture was so keyed on the F-16 that we were required to land within the first 1,000 feet, and most of the time we landed in the first 500 feet. Now, in the airline industry, it's at 2,000 feet. So my mind went back to, I said, 2,000 feet is way too far down. So on my second landing, I said, I'm going to correct that. Now, the reason in the F-16 we landed in the first 1,000 feet is because at the 1,000-foot marker, there is a cable that can be used, and we always landed prior to the cable. We did have a tail hook, but it was an emergency tail hook only. Once it's down, only a mechanic can put it back up. Well, guys, I have moved this thing out too far, this arm, and the little thing hit this, and it cracked it. Um, it's just a little crack down here. Um... Someday I'll repair it, but right now it's such a hairline crack that you can't see it, but just another casualty. Ugh. But yeah, I, can't, I had that thing too far out, so I need to watch that. Okay. So now back on my second airliner landing. I had landed on the first one at 2,000 feet down, which is exactly where you want to land an airliner, but on, in my mind, I wanted to land closer to 1,000 feet like the F-16. So I decided to delay when I flare the aircraft. Now, the flare is the transition from flying to landing. So now when it was time to flare, I decided to delay just a little bit. And that's when the instructor said, flare, 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 flare. Kaboom, we hit. Now, I looked over at him expecting for him to say, I had the aircraft call the crash trucks, and he just calmly said, put it in reverse. So I got her all slowed down, and we taxied back to the gate. I had my tail between my legs, and he just said, hey, you got to remember to flare. Now, it was embarrassing enough to have passengers on board, but the flight attendant, the lead flight attendant, knew I was new, and she just came up and said, now, don't feel bad. Now, of course, that makes me feel worse. Now, later on, I told a Boeing engineer that story, and I told him, I'm surprised I didn't break the airplane. He said, you could be descending twice the normal rate and not break the airplane. So from then on, my new normal was 2,000 feet down the runway. That's like glass. It's like butter. Well, I'm actually very pleasantly surprised. I mean, wow. I've got uh, 840 and a half thousandths in three spots and 839. So from that point everywhere else is a uh, one and a half thousandths. So I'm not exactly sure why that one's slightly different but that is letting me know that if there's any air the air is probably coming from the vise. And I do have a little bit of air. That, that really makes me feel good. Okay, so now I can start chasing what I need to do with the, to make the vise come in. But <laughs> that is, and the finish on there is just nice. I can see some vibration lines in there, and I am chasing some vibration. But it's really, wow, it's just beautiful how that uh, has turned out. Beautiful. Well guys, a couple of lessons learned. Uh, on the accuracy, uh, one of the things I learned is 
if you're going to be trying to square up a part and try to measure off of it, you can't have crazy angles and clamping on that. You have to get everything square, it's got to be flat, and that's how you can figure out some accuracy. Also, there could be accuracies in all kinds of things. What you think might be it may not be it. So you just start off at square one and hopefully you can figure it out. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you on the next Journey to Journeyman.